and, and this is maybe one of those implicit misunderstandings that are informing the question, which is that, you know, from a shamanic paradigm, if, if there's such a thing, you know, like, what would you describe as happening to a person when they enter into a psychotic episode? I mean, my immediate assumption of what a psychotic episode might look like, um, if it's really dark, would be like, you know, the demons are coming for me, everyone's a demon, um, you know, everyone's lying, nothing is real, like derealization, I don't know who I am, I'm not real, depersonalization, or like a uh, like what's the term like a Christ complex all of a sudden they believe they are God um, but not in a way like we are God but like I am the God <laughs> you know like so from 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 a sh- from a shamanic standpoint you know what is happening to their mind to their spirit um, and why well I think that they're you know I I'm going to use terminology that isn't really from the mythology of shamanism, but I think they're moving into the collective consciousness and they're moving from a personalized egoic state where they only apply a very small amount of what's in the collective consciousness to themselves. And they're entering into a state of mind and a state of consciousness that starts to misinterpret many aspects of that collective consciousness. And when that happens, um, if you don't have the Ikaros to know how to handle that, you should not be leading a ceremony. Hmm. And that's the simplest answer. Like if you do not know Ikaros and you do not know the chants and you do not know how to guide and direct that ceremony, you are not practicing safe and responsible traditional medicinal practices. And you have to learn those. You have to learn how to be able to handle literally every single kind of state that could happen in a ceremony and know how to sing the different kinds of chants to be able to reorient that person's psyche to bring them back into a grounded and sane and safe state. Mm -hmm. And um, in the traditional practices, the way that you typically do that is with other kinds of expressions of mythologies and reality for them that takes them out of that state. So that it becomes just a very short transitory time that they thought that way. And then they realize that there wasn't truth behind the nature of those kinds of thoughts. And you need to be able to utilize what shamans call spirits to be able to do that. You have to know the trees and you have to know the plants that can reorient those kinds of states. You have to be able to know those ikaros and you have to be able to have the presence and wherewithal and ceremony to be able to guide and direct that. And those would be considered literal basics in our lineage and our practices. Not something that not even not even like further down the road. Those are literally the basics is how to deal with those kinds of very extreme states of consciousness that people can enter into in ceremony. And um, I think also afterwards, if somebody's had those kinds of thoughts or had those kinds of experiences, very important to bring them back into a state of personalization where they understand that lots of people in history have thought that way and that those are thoughts and that there's a difference between reality and thoughts and that thoughts are something that we can have and we can think anything. It's how we end up creating Hollywood movies and these incredible, fantastical superhero concepts that are out of other kinds of mythologies that are just fundamentally not part of a grounded, stable, everyday understanding of life and that those kinds of thoughts uh, are okay to have, but they're not something that needs to be turned into any kind of action or behavior. Mm. And that it's, it's a way to experience thinking and that it's okay to have an expanded mind for a period of time, but then to root a personalization and an egoic complex about that is literally the opposite of the desire of the practice. And so people do go into those states literally often, not, um, not not uncommon at all, especially coming from uh, Western cultures where they have a kind of what I think of as a hodgepodge of mythologies that come from mostly reading in the Internet and little bits and pieces of ideas from lots of philosophies from around the world and lots of different kinds of religious philosophies from around the world. And it's not all together. It's not really one cohesive woven understanding of their own reality or their own ego or their own personality. And um, really, as a shaman, you need to be able to help somebody bring cohesiveness to that, not the opposite, which is that explosion into that kind of absolute terror. And again, if you uh, if you see, you mentioned the idea of demons, which is a Judeo-Christian and concept. It's also a Hindu concept. It's these idea of monsters. Well, 
you know, in our normal daily life, we don't see the monsters. The boogeyman really isn't under the bed. It's something absolutely imaginary. And if we're working with this idea of a benevolent container that is stronger than any of those uh, negative elements, you know, one of the things that we tell people when they see those things, that that's part of the consciousness that they've been brought up in and that that can be easily released back into that universe and is something that is ultimately not scary and doesn't need to be fixated on. And they can go into the concentration and focus into our ikaros, which is literally moving them into a state of consciousness that's not including those kinds of visions. And if they are still have those kinds of visions to be able to come up to us in ceremony so that we can literally help shift their consciousness out of those kinds of paradigms. And I literally think of it like tuning a radio. Hmm. For some reason, their radio got tuned to those channels where they're seeing those kinds of fears and those kinds of representations of the psychomagical and mythological. And we need to change that radio dial to a frequency that is really about love and harmony and the release of those kinds of fears and really no need to fixate into those spaces and to move on from that so that that is just a very short period of time of a ceremony and ultimately something that helps them in a purge and a transition to something that is actually uh, positively transformational. Hmm. So then we'd say, well, we opened up into an aspect of their collective conscious that that has that idea of demon demonography in it and negativity and darkness and this idea of, uh, of something very scary that is out there and potentially dangerous. And the idea is to literally have that uh, purged from their psyche and released in, in a way that allows them then into something that, again, is heart centered and grounded and, and not dissociating in those kinds of fears. So do you like do you apply like a psychoanalytical look at these types of experiences? Like, do you do you help people like, well, you know, you're experiencing demons as a, as a metaphorical representation of like a deep sense of fear or alienation or or whatever that's rooted in you know the 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 early the early social context of your childhood due to the relationship with your parents nested inside of a society that's fundamentally alienating through you know consumer capitalism and 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 you know like your worth defined by your productivity and goodness um, through productivity and stuff, or do you do you always sort of keep it more towards like just like grounding in that grounding in that love, grounding in that love, grounding in that love, and trusting that just bringing that person into that place sort of creates the physiological, psychological, sort of spiritual recalibration that allows them to sort through that dark stuff without needing to necessarily acknowledge where it's coming from. Well, the very first thing I tell people when they come to our center is that we're not interested in talk therapy. Hmm. And that that they've talked ab about everything enough, truly. I mean, I think we've we've beaten a dead horse so many times it has become enculturated. And I think everything that you mentioned about the state of the Western world is a kind of natural expression to why people have the minds that they have today. Hmm. I believe in a general concept that is both nature and nurture happening simultaneous without one side of genetics or biology being more important than the consciousness and psychology. I just don't think we as a collective group have yet fully uh, understood and studied it. Hmm. And so there's still this separation between what's uh, scientific understandings and religious understandings, mystical understandings and spiritual understandings, and they're compartmentalized. And so I, I try to understand that people are coming from all over the world with very different experiences of consciousness. And I keep the container to be consciousness itself, which is how we're assimilating information and data from this universe, how we're perceiving and why we're perceiving the way that we do. And some people come from, you know, hyper archetypalized states and understandings and other people come from backgrounds that wouldn't understand that language at all. And so instead of, uh, trying to coalesce everything into the timeline of one person, I really look at it more as a collective global human evolution that's been taking place somewhere between 500,000 and a million years that we have at least an archaeological record for and probably much deeper than that. And that there's a really a continuous flow of evolution that is both biological and experiential that isn't so highly focused on the individualized ego and this experience that we all have shared from 
uh, really the procreational experience of our parents that ultimately made us in the form of single cell and then this incredible experience of cellular division and growth that have turned us into the people that we are today. And you can interject into that understanding of flow of change, any kind of society, any kind of culture, literally any kind of individualized experience, uh, whether it be with parents that you know, made you perform or parents that literally died. And so they weren't there to make you perform. Mm. And, you know, it, it doesn't really matter then uh, why we have experienced what we've experienced. We just understand that we have and we have experienced, um, you know, something that is highly complex. All of us who live in modern societies lived in a very highly complex culture that has really demanded a tremendous amount from us and that there have been secondary effects associated with that. And I try to share with people that, you know, we've been taught a mind, but we haven't really been taught how to use the brain as a true tool yet. We've been taught this mind and the mind comes from a very consistent series of linguistics that we share that allows us to have this podcast and conversation, et cetera. But that the actual tool that's being used is something more fundamental to that and actually something much more miraculous, which is the entire body, including the brain and its ability to cognate and have these different kinds of experiences. And so I think it's something as vast as uh, ayahuasca and the practices of spiritual transformation and medicines is uh, too vast to encapsulate to that of just the single understanding of individual life. And it really helps to have a context that understands that collectively we have all gone through trauma. We have all gone through difficulties. We have all gone through transformational experiences, which has ultimately brought us to these experiences. And that what we're trying to do is step outside of the personalization and personification and the creation of identity and the traumas themselves to understanding that this is something that we've all collectively shared. And that by understanding that we can then release the egoic attachment to it and realize that we do have the capacity and the power within us to be able to create new decisions and new directions and new changes in our lives that really are life advantageous and that we don't have to continuously be the repercussions and re-manifestations of those difficulties and pains and uh, formative issues from our past. That there has to be a way for us to be able to find a kind of true liberation and um, if it's if it's even if it's not from something ultimately negative, but just something that's confining that is in the way of our true growth and development while we're alive and that this idea that we can continuously learn and that we can continuously grow and ultimately continuously benefit from our life experience is something that we have the power to guide and direct.